Hi, uh, we're here with uh, Professor Hector Garcia Molina from the uh, University of Stanford. Uh, we also have uh, Chris uh, Grant from the University of Florida. My name is Alejandro Gutierrez from the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. Um, so, we wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, hope they're not too hard. Um, one of the questions that uh, we were wondering is you know, we were trying to find out how your creative process goes to come up with new research ideas, new research topics. So could you talk about a little bit about that? Uh, well, <coughs> it's, it's hard to explain when you have good ideas. I mean, sometimes you have a problem and, and you think about it for days and nothing clicks and then all of a sudden when you're doing something else you have an idea that might work. Uh, so it's really unpredictable. I don't have a, a special formula. Uh, you just have to try to think in unusual ways about things, not be embarrassed by coming up with solutions, because I think that's what I tell my students, often they're worried about suggesting something really stupid. Uh, and I thought, don't worry, I mean, because it's hard to tell whether it'll be stupid or, or it'll be brilliant. So just talk, let's bring out ideas, and then we'll see if they're, if they're good or, or not. So with, with that said, do you have any expectations of when you will have ideas or when you would publish certain papers, and if you maybe don't meet those because you went through a dry spell, you kind of go crazy or something. Do you ever have any uh, expectations like that? No, at, at this point, I guess at my stage in my career, it's more of the, the students, the graduate students that have the expectations that are on a tight schedule. For me, I, I'm really not that pressured these days if, in, in terms of I need to publish so many papers this year because it's, it's not going to impact me that much. But I do worry about the students, right? That they, they, my PhD students, well, they should, they need to be publishing some papers if they want to get a good job. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, a, it's on their behalf that I worry sometimes. Put the pressure on them. So, can you tell us about any hobbies you have besides computing to, to take your mind off the students and um, the emails? Well, the, my main hobby, as uh, as I think you know already, is photography. So I'm a, a, a amateur photographer, and I like taking pictures of people, either portraits or sports photography. I'm a volunteer photographer for the Stanford Athletic Department, and I have a press pass so I can go to the games yeah, and nice. stand on the sidelines and, and watch the action and, and take lots of photos. Okay. So that's how I spend my free time. Um, I was also wondering, uh, what advice do you give your uh, first year PhD students? So we can share it with everybody. Um, advice? Uh, Research-wise, coursework-wise. Uh, how do they build up you know, the research uh, skills well, to be a successful PhD student? The main advice I give them is to get involved in some project as soon as possible, not to fret for too long as to which project I'm going to work, or uh, just pick something and, and get going, uh, because often only when you're doing something, when you roll up your sleeves and are actually doing some work, do you find the interesting solutions or the interesting problems. Uh, and if you just sit on the sidelines trying to decide what to work on, uh, it, it's not as productive. For example, we often find at Stanford that <coughs> students who come in and have fellowships, so they're not assigned to a specific project for their support, tend to take longer to graduate than the students that come in without external support and are funded by a research project. They tend to do better and f or faster at finishing their PhD because from the minute they get there, they have to be working on something um, and they're more productive. So yeah, along the same lines, so for first year students, are there any attributes or uh, characteristics in students that you see that you know the student's going to be a great graduate student coming in or by meeting in the first day? Are there any things you can no, oh, it's, it's it hard random? to tell. That, well, it's not random, but it's hard to tell. I need to work with them more than just one or two days to figure out how, how they're going to do. Because there's a number of factors. I mean, hard working, they have to come up with good ideas, uh, some have good taste in selecting problems. So it's not something that you can just see immediately. Or I haven't found, figured out how to, <coughs> how to tell that quickly. Um, along, along the lines of your uh, creative process, uh, like the, you know the writer's block, and people get blocked and they just cannot write. Mm -hmm. uh, does it happen to you? And how do you, you know, what kind of activities do you get involved and then, you know, proceed with your work? 
Well, I personally haven't had much of a block other than just a day. I mean, some days, yeah, you're just not productive, so you just it's better not to even try writing because uh, oh. fixing the errors is it's going to take longer. So just stop, do go off, take some photos, do something else, and then try the next day. But usually a day or two is enough to clear my mind, and then I can uh, continue writing. I, I'm not, I haven't had the what you see in the movies where somebody's blocked for three months oh. or a year. That hasn't happened. I guess I'm lucky. Yes. <laughs> so, so you did your PhD at Stanford. You left and went through the whole tenure process at Princeton. At Princeton, yes. And then you came back to Stanford. At Stanford after 12 years at Princeton. Yeah. So, <coughs> have you seen the culture change from graduate students now to when you were a graduate student? Like in any ways, is it, easy, is it easier to be a graduate student now than it was back then? Uh, well, of course, we always think that it was harder when we were students, right? <laughs> <laughs> The, the PhD exams were a lot harder when I was a student. Uh, no, I don't think it's changed that much. I mean, you still see very smart people. Uh, the problems are different, but but the, I think it's very it's very similar. Also, people ask me, do you see a big difference between Princeton and Stanford? And again, the academic communities I think are are, are very similar at, at, at most of the top universities. So I didn't see a big sort of East Coast versus West Coast difference between the universities. At least in in the computer science departments that I was in. Okay. Uh, I'm going to the okay, so how do you interact with other universities? I know you um, you may do stuff with Wisconsin. I think in the database community, you guys do some type of collaboration. So how do you do you go to a actively seek after those relationships, or do they just kind of happen because of mutual interest? I think they they mostly happen because of mutual interest. Often it's a graduate student that. Uh, helps us with the connection. Say an undergraduate from Wisconsin who comes over and, and, and is starting our PhD program and then wants to go and spend the summer in Madison uh, and, and through that person. Or maybe they two of our one of our students and one of their students meet at Google, for example, for a summer internship and they get involved and start doing some, some joint work. So I think that's also the most productive um, interactions that I know of. Sometimes we have, we have joint projects for funding um, we have a, a, a project, uh, multiple universities funded by the National Science Foundation, for example. So for that project, we have to get together periodically, and we bring along our students, and students start talking to each other, and sometimes interactions get started that way. But by far, most of the um, interactions between students are within our group. Uh, students that are working with my colleague, Jennifer Whittem, for example, and myself, because we're in the same wing of the building. We get together all the time and, and, and it's a lot easier to start interactions. Well thank you much. Thank you very much for My pleasure. Time. Thanks for listening to me. Thank you very much. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Next stop is Oprah.